talking to those of you online for uh, who are now joining. This is Clearview Community Church. I'm Pastor Grant, and we're glad that you are joining us this morning. Uh, just some announcements. Um, so next Saturday, June 11th, we're going to be doing a church cleanup here, and that'll be starting at 9 a.m. If you want to know any more details about that, you can contact Herb or Joyce, Frank, about that. But that'll be Saturday, 9 a.m. Our spring wind-up is coming up, too. That'll be the following weekend, Saturday, June 18th. We ended up moving that date to then because there was a bunch of people after service that were watching online that said that day worked better and we didn't want to interfere with the grad event that was happening the following weekend. So Saturday, June 18th is when we will be doing that. We'll be starting at 3 p.m. And we're just planning to have a time of family and community together and we'll be doing games and food so there's going to be a potluck and if you have any yard games bring those they're welcome and let's just have fun together uh, we are looking for one more person to help with that if uh, if that's you and you feel led please contact hannah and um, she can let you know where you can plug in for that so that'll be two weekends from now uh, I believe we're still looking for assistance for Bill Hill. He needs a ride into Saskatoon on the 12th of July for 1 p.m. So feel free to reach out uh, to him, and I can give you that number if you need that later. Uh, another announcement. Um, a member of our church, Paul Hauser, is in the hospital right now, and he, um, his wife uh, was asking, Rose, was asking for some help at the house. He's taken on some renovations, and they're not quite finished. And um, I'm sure most of you know what that's like. <laughs> we take on projects that we can't quite finish. So they're looking for some help, and I just think it would be great as a church if we could go and bless them by finishing off some rooms. So that'll involve hanging some drywall, doing some mudding and painting. So I'm hoping to do that in the next couple of weeks. That'll be myself and Ron Baker kind of heading that up. But if you would like to join in on that, I would appreciate the help to bless them. Uh, as well, uh, as I mentioned last week, we're still looking for people to help in the music area here at church. And if that's you, please feel free to reach out to me and uh, I'd love to have a conversation about that. And then the last announcement I have is... Um, the manor has been asking if we could start doing some services at the um, facility there on Sunday afternoon. So I've agreed to step on for one Sunday a month, and that'll involve a little devotional time and some worship. So if again, if you wanted to join in for some of that worship time, or even if you felt led to lead the devotion that day, um, it'd be great to kind of take this on as a church together. So feel free to reach out to me about that. The first one is going to be the end of the month, June 26th, and that runs from 2.30 to 3. Okay, I'm just going to open in a word of prayer, and then we will jump right into our message this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for being with us here in this place this morning, and with those at home online. I just pray that your word would come alive to us this morning, that uh, you would just open our hearts to what you have to say to us this morning. Lord, this morning we have a heavy message, and I just pray that your peace would be with us and that um, you would help us to uh, see the hope that you have for us in this message this morning. We thank you for your son Jesus and what he did on the cross for us, and that um, we don't have to worry about um, sin and death and the hold it used to have on us that um, he paid the price for that and that because of that we can now come freely to you and cling to you. We thank you for your blessings each and every day. In your name, amen. So this morning I want to continue in our series on getting to know Pastor Grant. And I have been doing that through uh, sharing the testimonies of people in Scripture that I find resonate with my own story. Today, we're going to be looking at Job. Um, now, I don't think I've had to struggle nearly as much as Job did, but there's parts from his story that I can pull. 
So before we get there, I want to take and give a little bit of a background on Job and how he got to the situation he's in where we'll read this morning. So in the book of Job, in the very beginning, it describes Job as a man who is blameless and upright in character. He's blessed with a family, he has lots of possessions, and his life embodied a fear of God that was for himself, but also on behalf of his family. Now, just because Job was blameless doesn't mean that he was sinless. He was just like any other person. He would have faced the same temptations that we do, but the difference with Job was his attitude toward God and his thankfulness for everything in his life. The book continues and it shares a debate between God and Satan. And that's in, uh, so Satan in Job chapter 1 verses 19 to 11, he basically implies that God's policy of blessing the righteous is counterproductive for the development of true righteousness. Satan believes that um, by God blessing people, um, they will be more likely to be righteous only because of what they have to gain from it. It's kind of like they're only going to do it if I get something in return. So it's a wrong motive. So Satan challenges God by saying that if you cut off Job's blessings, then I bet no longer would he pursue you or pursue righteousness. In fact, I bet he would curse you, God, if you took away away his blessings. The beginning of the book is really important for us as readers And it describes something that Job's friends bring up again and again throughout the remainder of Job. We're not going to get there, but I just want to share this point. And that point is, to what extent does the circumstances of Job's life on earth reveal what is true about him before God? So basically, what they're talking about is what they called a retribution principle. Now, this principle was if someone was righteous before God then that person would prosper. They would be blessed. But if that person was wicked before God, they would suffer uh, because of the consequence. It's an action, sorry, it's a consequence for their actions, um, the result of their sin. So if they're wicked before God, they'd be punished. Now, Job's friends had assumed that Job must have sinned in some way to God, and for that reason, God was punishing him. And they argue with Job that he needs to either repent and agree with God or just continue on receiving the punishment and the suffering. But Job insists that he has done nothing wrong. And he does acknowledge, though, that it's God who has allowed these things to happen for some reason that he doesn't know. And Job, later on in the book, he argues God's own character back to him in lament, saying, Uh, God, where is your righteousness? Where is your justice in this? It doesn't seem to be present for me in my situation. So that's a bit of a backstory to where Job is right now. And now we're going to take and read in chapter 1. I just want to read verses 13 13 to 19 first, and then we'll continue on. And I will be reading from the New Living Translation. So Job 13. Chapter 1, verse 13. Satan takes Job's property and children. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean riders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. 
Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed, and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. We see here that Job has lost a lot of things that were dear to him. Some of these things were replaceable, but some irreplaceable. Job's troubles are described as coming from multiple directions. So the Sabians, they were from the south, and then you have the fire from heaven coming down. The Chaldeans were from the north, and the powerful wind came from the wilderness. Each tragedy is presented in rapid succession, one after the other, and it was just the way that Satan had planned it. This way, Job would be rocked with all the news at once rather than finding out bit by bit and having a little bit of time to process. Instead, it was all thrown at him at once. And then there was only the one messenger that survived from each situation to tell the story. And the way Satan had orchestrated all this, it left Job breathless, as he says in chapter 9, verse 18. So verse 13 in chapter 1 begins by stating how all of Job's sons and daughters were feasting together that day. Back in verse 2 of chapter 1, it says that Job had seven sons and three daughters. And it says that they enjoyed each other's company and threw parties very frequently. And that Job would then pray and sacrifice on their behalf afterwards. The prologue also talks about Job's wealth and how he had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 50 yoke of oxen, so that's like two oxen per yoke, so it's pretty well 100 oxen, sorry, 1,000 oxen, and then he also had 500 female donkeys, as well as many servants making Job the wealthiest man in the country. And then verses 14 and 15 mark the beginning of Job's tragedies. The first is that Satan strips Job of his oxen and the donkeys along with the servants attending to them. Now it's important to note that the Sabians came and took the livestock and killed the servants while they were working in the field. This way, uh, Job couldn't blame the servants for a lack of care or trying on their part. And as the messenger said, he was the only one to escape. Everyone else died trying to stop this. Then verse 16 marks the next loss. And this one happens from a supernatural cause. It says that the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up all his sheep and the servants attending to them except the messenger. Now, this attack from Satan was meant to make Job question his standing with God. Satan took all his sheep because the sheep for Israel were very symbolic. And that was because they were the animal used in sacrifice for the dead of sin. And by taking all of Job's sheep, remember that's 700 sheep, not just a couple. He and his friends, Job and his friends would have seen this as God being angry with Job and his sacrifices. And Satan was hoping that this would cause Job to curse God. Verse 17 marks another tragedy, but this one is, again, by the hands of man. Now, this, thir- this is the third tragedy, but the second one from another nation. And this was meant to make Job think that he was certainly in the wrong with God, because it wasn't just one people group attacking him, but multiple people groups attacking him. And Satan is trying to get Job to curse God. But see, we have an extra insight that Job doesn't have. We know that God has been allowing Satan to test Job's righteousness, while at the same time proving Satan wrong. So just remember, we have that extra insight right now where Job doesn't. Verse 18 and 19 mark the final tragedy that Satan throws at Job, and this one is by a natural cause, the wind. So as the messenger reports, Job's children are all feasting like they were in the beginning, and it said that they did it frequently. But while they were doing so, the powerful wind came up from the wilderness 
and hit each wall of the house and made it collapse. Now, Job has had all these tragedies and they come from the hands of multiple nations, natural disasters, supernatural disasters. He cannot think that these are just flukes, but rather God is behind all of this. And Satan wants him to think that. Satan wants him to curse God for it. Satan also saved this tragedy for last so that it would take Job to his breaking point. Since all these other things have been boiling up to this moment, he was hoping that he would push him past his limit here. The loss of a child is tough, and this week as a community, we've experienced that. Uh, the loss of little Lincoln. Our children are a piece of ourselves, and it's very hard to part with them. And for Job, he lost all ten of his children in one shot, and that's unimaginable. And unfortunately, Satan doesn't stop here in jo for Job in uh, our story this morning. In chapter 2, he continues on to attack Job's health. With all these things against Job, he surely must be ready to curse God. Let's continue. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Jumping ahead of myself. Now, I haven't gone through anything nearly as um, traumatic as Job has. I haven't gone through what people in our community have gone through this week, personally. But I do remember the times where I had to go through things that tested my faith. As I had mentioned last week, uh, I was working in the trades. I had had my own home when I was struggling with what my purpose was in life. And I remember feeling like I was working so hard but not being rewarded for that. Then once I took the next step, God had called me into ministry. And what happened next was a series of things that I had to let go of. The first thing that I had to let go of was a job. I had enjoyed my stair trade job that I was doing, um, and I was good at it, but my boss only wanted someone full-time, not part-time. So I had to give that up in order to go back to school. Uh, some of you would know what this is like, and bosses don't necessarily take too well for saying, I'm quitting working here so that I can go back to be a pastor. They don't really understand that. Um, the second loss that I had to face was my house that I had. Uh, with being full-time in school and only being able to keep a part-time job, I wasn't really able to keep up with the bills of the house as I thought I would be able to. And it had gotten down to the point where I was putting my last few dollars in my gas tank and hoping that I would get home from school that night. And then there was also a lot of defeat that I had felt in that time because I had to move back in with my dad and live with him. And we w didn't have the best relationship at that time. And we really butted heads on this because he could not understand why I would throw away a trade in order to go back to school to become a pastor. In his mind, it made absolutely no sense. And it probably doesn't make sense to some of you this morning. And for me at that time, it didn't other than I knew God was in it and that he was leading me. Uh, the next thing, fast forward a little bit, that um, went was a truck that I had. Now, this was an old Ford that I had that I built up from the ground up, full restoration. Um, I was very proud of it. And one night when I was leading a worship practice at church, it got stolen and I had come out and it was gone. <laughs> And of course, uh, being a young teenager and not thinking much about it, I had left my wallet in the truck too. So all that was gone too. I remember feeling so violated and I remember yelling at God and asking him, why were all these things happening to me? I'm doing what you have called me to do. It's supposed to be easier from now on. Why? Why, why is this happening? The final straw for me uh, was when I got the door slammed shut. Uh, it was a job opportunity I was pursuing at my home church that I was growing up in. I wanted to um, pursue a position as a youth pastor there, 
and everything was lined up, it was ready to go, and then all of a sudden, door shut. The housing we had planned was gone, um, the funding was gone, and then I remember God telling me that I had to pack up and leave that church, and it made no sense to me. I remember asking God where he was and what was he doing in this. It didn't seem fair. Now, when I listen back to this part of my story, I can't help but think of a country song. (laughs) Um, And unfortunately, I can't just play it backwards to get all my stuff back. But anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, I want to continue with the remainder of our chapter this morning, verses 20 to 22. Let's, um, Let's read what Job does in this situation. Let's see his response. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. And then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Job responded in a way that allowed him to express what he was feeling while still honoring God. Ripping clothes and shaving your head may may seem extreme for us this morning, but for Job in his context, that was a perfectly normal thing to do, and it was the expected thing to do. People would even hire other people who were professional wailers, professional criers, to come and cry on their behalf in order to respect um, the past, kind of like how we would have a funeral or a celebration of life for an individual who's passed. But what Satan didn't account for in this was that Job would turn toward God instead of cursing him. Job turns and worships God. In this moment, the darkest hour of Job's life, Job could have easily turned away from God but instead he draws closer to him. But he does bring his laments to him. Job's response gives us a situation, um, an explanation for what it truly means to submit to the will of God. The only greater example we have in Scripture is from Jesus when he submitted to the will of his Father on the cross. Verse 21 directly quotes Job. And it says how he came from his mother's womb naked and how he's going to leave naked. What Job meant here was that he had come into the world with nothing and he's going to leave it with nothing. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 7 says that godliness with contentment uh, is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. What Paul is saying here is that being content with righteousness is greater than any material gain we could ever have or get. Job, with this statement, is acknowledging that God's hand has been present both in the blessings he has once enjoyed and also in the tragedies that he faces. It's like the last song we had sung there uh, before our service, uh, Blessed Be Your Name. The bridge says, you give and you take away. Job shows us how we need to embrace God's divine providence in our lives. It is the Lord who made us and gave us what we have. So what right do we have to say that he can't take away what was his to begin with? Job's testimony also shows us how the trials we face need to draw us closer to Jesus rather than push us away. In the situations that I had faced, I had two options. I could turn away from God or I could run toward him. This didn't mean that I wasn't allowed to bring my complaints before God. In fact, he welcomes them. We read example after example from David in the Psalms and how he poured his heart out to God in lament. But the key is that our complaints need to turn into praise. We can't stay in that state. This past semester before I had graduated, I took a course on Christian apologetics. Now, that's not how to learn how to apologize as Christians. The word apologia in Greek means defense. 
So it's a class on how to defend your faith. And in that class, we talked about a subject that ties into our passage this morning, and that is the problem of evil. So philis- sorry, <laughs> philosophers and atheists have tried to use this argument for years to prove that God doesn't exist. The argument goes like this. If God is all-loving, all-knowing, and all-powerful, then how come there's still evil in the world? They say that if God has all of these qualities, then he should be able to stop or even eliminate evil. But because there is still evil, God must not exist or he doesn't have all of these qualities. But we, of course, know that God does have all of these qualities. He is all-powerful, he is all-knowing, and he is all-loving. So what we're left with is trying to figure out why doesn't God stop evil? Or why do bad things happen to good people? God, where's the justice in that? So when someone is addressing this problem, there's two ways to go about answering it. Now, the first way I like to call the care approach. And that's when you're faced with a situation where someone has experienced a great tragedy and they're just trying to make sense of it. And then the second way is more of a theological approach. And that's just someone who's looking to debate and setting out to wrestle more broadly on why does evil happen in general. Uh, This morning I want to focus on the care approach. But if you are more interested in that theological part, that is important too. And after the service, I'd be more than happy to give you some resources to read on that. Now, the first thing to note here is that there's different types of evil. Just like Job had experienced different types of tragedies. So there's moral evils, and that's kind of talks about why do people hurt other people. There are natural evils that are kind of like natural disasters, like earthquakes, tornadoes, disease. And then there's supernatural evils like demons, spiritual warfare, um, things that are talked about in the New Testament and that we're warned about as Christians. What we need to realize is that, like Job and his friends um, were trying to figure out, was that we're basically putting together a puzzle, but we don't have all of the pieces. Some of them are missing. God doesn't reveal the full picture to us. Unfortunately, we can't fully explain why the certain things in our lives happen. But scripture does provide us with some reasons as to why they might happen, and it also provides us with some comforts um, for those who follow Jesus. Now, we know from Genesis chapter 3 that the world is a fallen place and that evil had entered into the world through sin. And sin has been passed through Adam and Eve all the way down to you and me this morning. The first sin happened because God has created us humans with free will. And this means that we are able to make our own decisions. And God cannot interject on that. Because if he did interject, then we wouldn't really be truly free. Now, this is often used to explain how someone could do something really evil to someone else. Kind of like what Hitler did to the Jews back during the Holocaust. Another way of understanding why evil is in the world is that sometimes evil is the consequence for our sins. But I want to put a disclaimer here. We need to be careful not to jump to a conclusion like Job's friends did. Just because bad things are happening to someone doesn't mean that they did something bad to begin with. In John chapter 9, verses 2 to 3, Jesus' disciples see a blind man and they ask him questions uh, that were basically feeding into a stereotype that they had in their time. It says, And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, uh, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We too need to be careful not to make the same mistake. How often do we judge someone by their appearance or the situation that they're in and assume that they must have done something wrong to themselves in order to have gotten to that place? 
when really it could be kind of like Job's story where God's trying to use them for a greater cause, one to glorify his name. But what about natural evils? Well, sometimes if God were to try and take and counter or eliminate evil, then he would be contradicting to laws and rules of logic and reality. Yes, we understand that miracles happen, and those are things that cannot be explained by science, but there's still things that just simply can't be done, like having a square circle or having a married bachelor. They contradict each other and just can't be. So sometimes bad things happen so that better things can happen. But you might be thinking that that's a terrible thing to say. What about the case of where someone is dying from cancer? We know people in our church who have cancer. Or like this week, the death of a young child. How can that be a better thing? We would say that it would be better if they were still here with us or if they weren't sick. But we also know that disease and death are byproducts of sin. Before the fall, there was none of that. And now God has been working on restoring us back to the garden. That's the goal. That's what he's been working on all through history. We, we read that in the Bible. What it comes down to is that we truly don't know the whole picture. There is a reason that only God knows. There could have been a worse outcome if things didn't go the way they did. And that's hard for us to swallow. But thankfully, God knows that. God, through his son Jesus, knows exactly the kinds of hurt and pains that we experience each and every day. God took, his, God took sin and its evil effects upon himself because he loves us. Jesus had to face hunger, fatigue, betrayal, ridicule, rejection, suffering, and even death on the cross. He beat all of it, and he made it so that those hurts and pains wouldn't be the end of our story. Rather, our story will continue with him in paradise. This is only temporary. I also think that part of the reason why God doesn't just completely eliminate evil altogether is because he's still waiting for as many people as possible to come back to him, to come back home, to embrace Jesus. He doesn't want to leave anyone behind. Like Job figures out, God doesn't give us all the answers, but he does answer the needs of our hearts. God doesn't give us all the answers, but he does answer the need of our heart. If we were to read on to the end of Job, we would learn that God is going to challenge Job on how he has no right to question God's governance over circumstances that happen on earth because it is God who is sovereign over all, not Job. But God does attend to Job's heart. He ends up vindicating him before his friends and he restores blessings upon him. But we need to remember that that wasn't the point of the story. That's not the purpose of the book of Job. We already knew that that side conversation was happening behind the scenes. The purpose of the book was to test God's policies and justice. And God's wisdom is far greater than ours. And that is why we cannot always make sense of the things that happen. What it boils down to for us this morning is, do we have the faith to trust that God is sovereign over all and that he is looking out for us? Like Job, we need to trust in God's promises to us. Revelation chapter 21 verses 3 and 4 say, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All things are for gone forever. Matthew chapter 5 verse 4 says, 
God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Isaiah chapter 25 verse 8 says, He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. Psalm 119 verses 76 and 77 says, Now let your unfailing love comfort me, just as you promised me, your servant. Surround me with your tender mercies so I may live, for your instructions are my delight. In Psalm 71, verses 20 to 21, say that, You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. Do we believe these promises to be true for us this morning? Tragedies are going to happen. And that's because we're part of a fallen race. Because of sin. And we just simply can't make sense of all of it. But God can. And he can help us through it because he's already bore all of it. And he knows the way. We just need to trust him and allow him in. I want to close this morning by reading a prayer from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. Lord, this message this morning is a hard one to swallow. I just pray for your peace and your mercy upon us, that we would be able to um, think back to those passages, those truths in Scripture that say that you have conquered death, and that um, we are going to be all together with you again one day. We thank you for your son Jesus and what he did on the cross for each and every one of us. We thank you that he went through all the suffering that we could ever go through so that we have someone that is an advocate for us, someone that understands what we're going through personally. Lord, we thank you and we love you. Amen. We are going to get ready to move into our final song here, but um, for the people online, I just wanted to send you off with a blessing this morning. And this blessing is for everyone here as well. And this is from Numbers chapter 6 uh, in the end of the chapter. And it's Aaron's prayer over the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you for joining us this morning and we'll see you next week.